Welcome to our study of the book of Hebrews. This is a work of the Metaview Church of Christ in Mesquite, Texas. And now, here is Mike Heisall delivering the lesson. Hello. Thank you for tuning in to our study of the book of Hebrews. As we announced last week, we're going to pause for a couple of weeks on Hebrews 13, 15 and consider that text in a little bit more depth, especially as it relates to the broader question concerning whether it is right before God in light of the New Testament to worship God in church with instruments of music. You see, in Churches of Christ, we do something that seems a little bit strange uh, when compared to most all other church of, churches of our day, in that we worship God with singing without the accompaniment of instruments of music. So if you did not watch last week's installment of this study, you might go back and watch it. It's still uh, archived on YouTube. And um, today, maybe the best place to begin is just to again survey a couple of the relevant passages in the book of Hebrews, consider again some of the relevant points that were made last week, and then move forward in our discussion. And as we said at the end of last week's video, the primary purpose of the lesson today will be to consider some of the arguments that people make to justify the use of instruments of music in worship. So. Let's notice, uh, again, the relevant passages in the book of Hebrews. So in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28, the Hebrews writer says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So the Hebrews writer encourages us to strive, be very careful, to worship God in a way that He will accept. And implied is the idea that if we're not careful, we might worship Him in a way that He would reject. Now that thought is one that is very foreign to many people in evangelical churches today. The general thought is, as long as a person is sincere, whatever they may do in worship, God will accept. But that's not a view that is easily backed up by Scripture. Last week we considered a passage from the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2, that challenges this notion. Nadab and Abihu, a couple of Aaron's sons, offered unauthorized worship before God. And not only did God refuse their worship, but God rejected them. He destroyed them. Consider another passage along this line in Leviticus chapter 19. It's in Leviticus 19 verse 5. And in this passage, here's what Moses says to the Israelites concerning their worship. He says, When you sacrifice a fellowship offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. You see, the implication is you could sacrifice it in such a way that it would not be accepted by God. And so how can we, or how could they be careful to offer their sacrifice in a way that God would accept it? Well, they have to be careful to offer it according to the rules that God inspired Moses to lay out. In fact, he continued with those rules, verse 6, It shall be eaten on the day you sacrifice it, or on the next day. Anything left over until the third day must be burned up. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it is impure and will not be accepted. Whoever eats it will be held responsible because they have desecrated what is holy to the Lord. They must be cut off from their people. Now again, as we noted from Leviticus 10, Moses warns that if someone uh, of the Israelites was not careful to offer their sacrifice in a way that God would accept it. Not only would their worship not be accepted, but they would be rejected. They would be cut off from among their people. And so these passages ought to cause us uh, to pause a little bit. 
no one should conclude that this study is a study that's passe. Because these passages, even though not binding upon us in their specifics, I mean, we're not required to offer fellowship offerings to the Lord. In fact, such would be wrong for us to do today. Still, there are principles found in them that's, that are relevant for us. You remember what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 15 verse 4, whatever things were written beforehand, that is the Old Testament, was written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The Old Testament is not written for our law, Romans 6 14, but it is written for our learning, Romans 15 verse 4. And so uh, let's turn back to Hebrews and let's notice what the Hebrews writer says is a way to worship God acceptably, a way to worship God uh, that will not be rejected. He says in Hebrews 13 and verse 15, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. And so since Jesus died on the cross and the shedding of His blood has atoned fully for sin, Jesus' sacrifice has done away with the need for animal sacrifice. And so no longer do God's people worship God with animal sacrifices. Now we worship God, the Hebrews writer says, with a sacrifice of praise. And then he specifies what that sacrifice of praise includes. He says that it includes the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. In other words, the sacrifice of praise we offer today is verbal. It's vocal. And last week we looked not just at Hebrews 13, 15, but also at other relevant New Testament texts, and we came to the conclusion that in the New Testament, the only type of musical worship that's authorized for the church is singing. It's, it's vocal. It's a cappella. There's no authorization for instrumental praise in the New Testament. Now someone may be thinking, well, yeah, but... You know, you're a Church of Christ preacher, and so you're biased. And so obviously, you're going to interpret the data in a way that will support your own tradition. Well, keep in mind that these are not just the conclusions of preachers and churches of Christ. These are the conclusions of a wide range of scholars. I want to read to you a passage that comes from the pen of Robert Rayburn. Now, Robert Rayburn has died since he wrote this, but he was a Presbyterian scholar. He was president of Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. And he wrote an entry for the Wycliffe Bible Dictionary on the subject of music. And here's what he said in his entry. Quote, There is no record in the New Testament of the use of instruments in the musical worship of the Christian church. Now, he goes on to say that the New Testament church did worship musically. The New Testament church sang, but he says there's no evidence at all in the New Testament that the church ever played instruments. And as we noted last week, instruments were not played for centuries. In fact, uh, let me read to you another quote from... Uh, the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. Uh, this was produced by James McClintock, or excuse me, John McClintock and James Strong in, I believe, the 1870s. Let's see, yeah, 1876 is when it was published. And it's a massive work, many volumes, but in the sixth volume, there's an entry on music. And here's what McClintock and Strong say, and by the way, they were not members of Churches of Christ. Quote, The general introduction of instrumental music can certainly not be assigned to a date earlier than the 5th and 6th centuries. Yea, even Gregory the Great, who toward the end of the 6th century added greatly to the existing church music, absolutely prohibited the use of instruments. Several centuries later, the introduction of the organ in sacred service gave a place to instruments as accompaniments for Christian song, and from that point to this, they have been freely used with few exceptions. The first organ is believed to have been used in the church service in the 13th century. 
Organs were, however, before this known in the theater. They were never regarded with favor in the Eastern Church and were vehemently opposed in some of the Western churches. In Scotland, no organ is allowed to this day except in a few Episcopal churches. And so again, uh, McClintock and Strong confirm what we noted last week, that it was after the time of Thomas Aquinas. It was in the 13th century before instruments were commonly used in churches. And he says that Eastern churches, that is, Orthodox churches, continued their opposition. In fact, to my knowledge, all Orthodox churches to this day, about 300 million, 250, 300 million worldwide strong, oppose the use of instruments, with the exception of a few Orthodox churches in the United States. In fact, uh, on the Orthodox Easter, which is a week after uh, when Easter is regularly celebrated uh, by other churches, uh, I watched an Orthodox Easter service on YouTube uh, live. And in that particular Orthodox church in New York, one of the striking things about the service, and there were many striking things about the service, was the fact that all of the music was a cappella. No instruments were used. But you know, in spite of the fact that a broad range of scholars say you can't find instruments of music in the church's worship in the New Testament, and in spite of the fact that it's clear by many scholars of many different backgrounds that instruments were not used for the first thousand plus years of the church's history, there are many people today who argue that instruments of music are legitimate. And so what are the arguments that they use to justify instruments? Surely they carry weight. Let's give some consideration to their arguments. And I don't know how many of these time will allow us to consider, but, but we'll notice some of the more popular ones. So the first one has to do with a Greek word in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Let me read the passage in the NIV, and then I'll point out the Greek word and I'll point out the argument. So Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. I have to find it first. The Apostle Paul said, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Now, the argument centers around the Greek word that's translated make music in the NIV. And the word is, it's a participle, psalantes. And it comes from the Greek ver verb psalo. And so the argument is that the word psalo originally meant to pluck the strings of an instrument. And so here Paul is authorizing then the use of instrumental music in church worship. And as an example of that argument, consider uh, John MacArthur's statement. Uh, you may be familiar with the name John MacArthur. Uh, he's an evangelical uh, pastor in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he pastors Grace Community Church. And if I'm not mistaken, he just celebrated his 50th anniversary with that church. But John MacArthur has been on the radio for years. He's also been on television. He's written many books. I mean, I can't even begin to count the number of books that he's written. And one of the works that he's responsible for is the MacArthur Study Bible. And so in the MacArthur Study Bible, uh, John MacArthur takes the English text at the top of the page and then supplies uh, notes on the text at the bottom of the page, like any study Bible. And so on Ephesians 5, and verse 19, here's what John MacArthur says concerning uh, this Greek word psalantes that's uh, translated make music in the NIV or my particular MacArthur study Bible is based on the New American Standard Bible which is uh, MacArthur's translation of choice. But uh, he, here's what he says concerning that word. Literally means to pluck a stringed instrument so it could refer primarily to instrumental music while including vocal also. And so, is that so? Does the word psalo in Ephesians 5.19 
justify instruments of music? Well, it seems like most would argue no. You see, words change their meaning over time. We could just point out uh, many examples from the English language, but take the word gay. We know what the word gay means in the 21st century. It means to be a homosexual. But go back 400 years. If you're reading in your King James uh, Bible, in James chapter 2, uh, the King James says that if a man comes into your assembly wearing gay clothes. Now, we have in our mind what it means to wear gay clothes. But 400 years ago, it, it didn't mean that you know, somebody would come in wearing, you know, a pink boa and you know, whatever else that might be considered gay clothing today. Uh, in that day, it just meant fine clothes. Gay has changed its meaning. Uh, several years ago, to say that someone was gay meant that they're happy. And so what's true in English was true in ancient languages as well. It was true in Greek. The word solo originally meant to pluck. It meant to pluck hair, for instance. And then over time, it meant to pluck the strings of an instrument. But, but many argue that at the time of the New Testament, the word solo simply meant to sing. For instance, uh, Joseph Henry Thayer uh, produced Thayer's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. It, it looks at the uh, Greek words that are used in the Greek New Testament, and it defines them. And in his entry on the word solo, after surveying uh, the, the history of the meaning of solo, here's what he says. In the New Testament, so here's how solo is used in the New Testament. To sing a hymn, to celebrate the praises of God in song. And so his argument is, by the time of the New Testament, it had changed its meaning and all it means is to sing. And by the way, that interpretation is the one that's supported by the evidence of history. Keep in mind, if the word solo means to pluck the strings of an instrument, then the word solo carries with it the force of a command. Granted, solentes, the word that Paul used, is just a participle, but it gathers its force from the imperative verb that's found in verse 18. And so if solentes means to play an instrument, then an instrument is demanded by the text. You cannot worship God acceptably without an instrument. But again, if you just look at the history of the church, 13 centuries passed before instruments were commonly used. The earliest Christians who knew the meaning of Greek words far better than any scholars today know the meaning of Greek words did not interpret the word psalantes to mean to play an instrument because they didn't. They obeyed Ephesians 5.19 by simply singing. But you know, even if you still subscribe to the meaning of solo as to play an instrument, keep in mind that whenever that word was used in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, for playing an instrument, it always supplied the instrument in the dative case. For instance, Psalm 32 in the Septuagint. Um, it would be Psalm 33 in our Bibles because in the Septuagint, Psalm 9 and 10 are one psalm. But here's what Psalm, uh, we would know it as Psalm 33. Here's what it says in the Septuagint. Ex amalagestha to curio in kithara, in psalantario decacordo psalata auto. Now, I know that that just blessed your soul. But here's how you would translate it. Acknowledge the Lord with the kithra. That, that's an instrument, a stringed instrument. With a ten-string psaltery, make music to him. So here you've got a form of solo. It's salata. It's, it's an imperative, so, so a command. But then this imperative to make music on an instrument, the instrument is supplied in the dative case. It's on a ten-stringed uh, psaltery. All right? So what's interesting is to notice what Paul says in the Greek New Testament in Ephesians 5.19. What he says is, psalantes te cardia humon to curio. So make music with your heart to the Lord. 
The point is, uh, if you argue that psalo means to play an instrument, Paul supplies the instrument that's to be played in the dative case after the manner of the Septuagint. And the instrument that's to be played is the heart, the human heart. In fact, Hugo McCord, who was a scholar in Churches of Christ, he translated uh, the New Testament into English. And here is how he translated Ephesians 5, 19. He says, Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and pluck the strings of your heart to the Lord. And so I think we have to say that the solo argument is not strong enough to bring a piano or to bring an organ or to bring a guitar into the church with God's approval. Well, a second argument that is often used from Ephesians uh, comes from the fact that we're commanded to sing psalms. Let me read Ephesians 5.19 again. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. And so the argument goes, well, we're commanded to sing the psalms, the psalms of the Old Testament. And when you read the psalms of the Old Testament, the psalms of the Old Testament command that one play instruments in the worship of God. For instance, Psalm 150 says, uh, we'll just begin at verse 3, Praise Him with the soundings of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. And so the argument goes, okay, so we're commanded to sing these psalms, but we're commanded to sing psalms that we can't practice? Surely if Paul tells us that we're to sing psalms, we can practice the psalms that we, practice, that we, uh, that we sing. Well, a couple of things. First of all, relative to the fact that Paul commands us to sing psalms in Ephesians 5.19, I have no doubt that the psalms of the Old Testament are included, but you'd have a hard time proving that those are the only psalms that Paul says we can sing. Maybe they include psalms that were written by Christians. But, but be that as it may, I don't deny at all that Paul is including here singing Old Testament psalms. But what does Paul authorize us to do with those Old Testament psalms? Read carefully what he says. He says, speaking to one another with psalms. He doesn't authorize us to practice the psalms that we sing. He only authorizes us to speak the psalms to one another. You say, so are you saying that we might sing psalms that we can't practice? That's exactly what I'm saying. And I think that if anyone who offers this argument will think just a little bit, they'll be of the same opinion. Consider some of the things that are commanded in the Psalms that we're allowed to sing. Consider Psalm 149, beginning in verse 6. May the praise of God be in their mouths. Well, that's all right. And a double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them, this is the glory of all his faithful people. Now, will anybody argue that the church is allowed to practice that psalm? Are we to leave our church buildings with swords in our hands and go out and slay unbelievers? No. And there are many other things that the psalms mention that nobody would argue the church is justified in practicing. There are psalms that mention animal sacrifice. Everybody believes that Jesus' sacrifice brought an end to animal sacrifice. So I don't believe that that argument carries enough weight to bring the organ, the piano, guitar, drums, whatever, into the church. Well, let's follow up that argument with a third one that, that's related to it. And the argument says, well, the Old Testament commanded the use of instruments of music and praise to God. God was pleased with uh, His people worshiping Him with instruments in the Old Testament. Surely He wouldn't be opposed to it now. And I would just say in reply to that, 
Well, the New Testament tells us, as we noted in some of our introductory comments, that the Old Testament commands have been done away. They were done away when Jesus died on the cross. For instance, we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 5. If you just go back to Ephesians chapter 2, where it seems like Paul is considering the question concerning whether or not Gentiles have to be circumcised according to the manner of the law of Moses in order to be saved. And here's what the Apostle Paul says, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and following. For he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups, that is Jew and Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. And this is just one of any number of passages that say in the New Testament that at Jesus' death, the commands of the Old Testament were done away. And so one errs by uh, justifying a particular practice for Christians by appealing to Old Testament commands. And so, so no, the New Testament is silent on the use of instruments of music in worship. Uh, the Old Testament commands to praise God with instruments, they were done away when Jesus died on the cross. Well, you, you may follow up by saying, well, well, but yeah, but would God be displeased in something now that brought him pleasure in the past? And I think that we have to see that, that yes, that's true. God is displeased now with something that brought him pleasure in the past. And that's not the only time that this has been true of God. Consider the instance of Moses and smiting the rock. You know, in uh, the Pentateuch, two times we're told that the Israelites were without water and were murmuring. And God told Moses two times to bring forth water from a rock. The first time is recorded in the opening verses of Exodus chapter 17. And on that occasion, God told Moses to take his staff and strike the rock and water would come out. The second time occurred 40 years later. It's recorded in the first part of Numbers chapter 20. And on that occasion, God told Moses to take his rod and to speak to the rock and water would come out. But you know what Moses did? Moses took his rod and he struck the rock twice and water came out. But God said what Moses did was disobedience and God forbade Moses from entering into the promised land, the promised land that he'd sought for 40 years because Moses had struck the rock. You see, what God had commanded and what brought God pleasure 40 years before was now something that God did not allow and something that brought God displeasure. And I would say that if we just look at the biblical evidence, that would be true. Yes, in the Old Testament, God was pleased with instrumental worship. But now in the spiritual New Testament, what God is pleased with is for people to play the strings of their heart. He's pleased with spiritual worship in His praise. But then that brings up another issue. There are a lot of people who would uh, try to justify the use of instrumental music by, say, by saying that, well, yeah, okay, so the New Testament doesn't explicitly command the use of instruments of music, but neither does the New Testament explicitly forbid the use of instruments of music. There, there's not a single passage of Scripture in the New Testament that says, thou shalt not worship him with instruments. And, and so they argue that it's speaking where the Bible is silent to say that it's wrong to use instruments of music. Now this brings up the age-old debate. Does the silence of the scriptures permit or does the silence of the scriptures prohibit? They would say that the silence of the scriptures prohibit or, or permits, excuse me. Anything that God does not explicitly prohibit is permitted. And I would take the position that anything that the Bible does not permit is prohibited. And so I would argue that the silence of the scriptures prohibits. Now, is there any uh, 
scriptural backing for arguing that the silence of the scriptures prohibits. Well, there are some passages. Let's just consider one. We've been studying the book of Hebrews. Consider Hebrews chapter 1, and let's look at verse 5. You know, the argument in Hebrews 1 is that the new covenant is superior to the old covenant because Jesus is responsible for delivering the new covenant and angels had a part in delivering the old covenant and Jesus is superior to the angels. So, so that's, that's the uh, discussion of Hebrews chapter 1, the superiority of Jesus to the angels. And so in Hebrews 1, 5, uh, here's what's said. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father, or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Now, the point of the Hebrews writer is that Jesus is a son of God in a way that no angel has the right to claim to be a son of God. Now, why can no angel claim to be a son of God in the same way that Jesus is the son of God? Well, the Hebrews writer says, here's the reason. It's because God never said to the angels, to any angel, you are my son, today I've become your father. He said that to Jesus, but the Hebrews writer says he never said that to an angel. Now, it's significant to note, there is no Old Testament passage in which God ever said to an angel, you are not my son, today I have not become your father. But the point of the Hebrews writer is no angel was permitted to claim that noble position because of God's silence. And so I would say that the Bible's silence does not permit something, but the Bible's silence prohibits something. Now, if someone wishes to continue to argue and say, well, well, no, no, that, I, I just don't think that that's right. I think that the Bible's silence permits things. Understand what sorts of things that person is going to have to accept if they're going to be consistent. Now, I'm not arguing that anybody ultimately would be consistent, but understand what sorts of things they would have to uh, accept. They would have to accept infant baptism. Now, I don't believe that infant baptism is right. In the New Testament, uh, the baptism that's authorized is the baptism of a responsible person who has the ability to trust in Jesus as their Savior and turn from their sin in repentance. I think that, that no infant has that ability. I, I don't think infant baptism is right, but you do know that there's not a single verse of Scripture in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not baptize infants. And so if silence permits, silence doesn't prohibit, then you've got to accept infant baptism. You know, further, if silence permits, silence doesn't prohibit, you've got to accept the legitimacy of the Pope. Now, I don't think the Pope is right. I think that it's sinful for someone to claim to be the Pope of all the church. My understanding is that each congregation governs itself under a plurality of elders under ultimately the authority of Jesus expressed through the writings of his apostles. I don't think that there's anybody outside of a local congregation who has the right to tell that congregation what to do. But you know, there is no verse in the New Testament that says, Thou shalt not have a pope. And so if silence permits, silence doesn't prohibit, you really don't have the right to say that a pope isn't right. And just to follow up on that a little bit, if silence permits, silence doesn't prohibit, you don't have the right to say that it's wrong to pray the rosary. You know, many a devout Catholic in worship prays the rosary. They pray to Mary. They don't worship Mary but they plead with Mary to intercede on their behalf with her son, Jesus Christ, in the same way that we would go to a living Christian and ask them to pray for us. They think that it's right to go to saints who have died, who have gone to heaven, and ask them to intercede. And so they, they pray to Mary not to worship her. They pray to Mary to ask her to intercede on their behalf. Now, I don't think that that's right. I don't think that it's right because the Bible doesn't authorize it. 
But if you think that the silence of the scriptures permits and the silence of the scriptures don't prohibit, you have no grounds to say that it's wrong to pray to Mary. You say, well, I do too. That's idolatry. No, no, no Catholic would, would say that they're worshiping Mary. They're opposed to idolatry. Again, they say that they're just asking Mary to pray on their behalf in the same way that they would ask somebody uh, who, who's alive and is a Christian to pray on their behalf. But if you don't think that the silence of the scriptures prohibits, if you think that it permits, you, you have no grounds to oppose prayers to Mary. You know, furthermore, if the silence of the scriptures does not prohibit, if the silence of the scriptures permits things, what grounds would you have to change up the Lord's Supper? Uh, you know, here recently, uh, during the quarantine, a local evangelical pastor encouraged members of his congregation in observing the Lord's Supper on Easter to grab whatever items they had available. You know, grab Coke and Cheetos and to allow them to substitute for unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Is that right? Would it be right whenever we come back together as a church to uh, observe the Lord's Supper with Cheetos and with Coke? Yeah, I mean, I know that whenever Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, but there is no verse of Scripture that says, Thou shalt not use Cheetos, thou shalt not use Coke. If the silence of the Scriptures does not prohibit, if the silence of the Scriptures permit, we have absolutely no right to oppose a change of that sort. And so I don't think this argument works. The New Testament never says, Thou shalt not. And there's a lot more that could be said about that, and I'm having to exercise all the self-control that I have not to say more about that. But we've gone 36 minutes so far, and um, we really can't upload a video that's much longer than that. So, so I'll, I'll stop at this point. L let me just say that I believe the New Testament to teach clearly that the only way that someone can worship God musically in the church that God will accept is to worship Him through song. I appreciate your good attention and look forward to studying with you more. God bless. We thank you for taking the time to study the Bible with us. We pray that this has been an edifying experience and that you would join us again. If at any point during the Bible study you had some questions, please feel free to email us at mhysaw at meadowview.org. The email is both on the screen and in the description. It is our goal to answer every Bible question with a Bible answer, to speak where the Bible speaks, and to be silent where it is silent. God bless you. We love you.